Thank you, Serena. Well, I've worn these robes at Stanford many times, but today they're whispering to me that they're very happy to be home. Last month, there was an earthquake in Silicon Valley. Nobody died, it wasn't even recorded by the US Geological Survey, but the foundation shook, people looked at each other in horror, and the landscape changed shape. Instagram, a free cell phone photography app written by two former Stanford students, was bought by Facebook for $1 billion. $1 billion. I teach a course on digital photography at Stanford. The morning after the sale, I started my lecture by popping up a clipping, uh, news clipping about the sale, waited for the students to read it, turned around to them and said, what are you still doing here? You should be in your dorm rooms writing photography apps. So what is Instagram? It lets you take a picture, apply colorful, funky, or retro filters to it, and upload it to your favorite social site. It won't end poverty, cure diseases, or bring world peace. Well, it might help with that by making it easier for us to share experiences. But the Instagram story is powerful because the idea is disruptive. Nikon and Canon have spent the last 80 years refining their cameras to produce good pictures. Instagram gives you 100 ways to turn a good picture into a bad picture. <laughs> the art world is built on a tradition of curation by schools, museums, galleries, and critics. Instagram lets you upload every picture you took to the public within five seconds of taking it. Curation is done by liking a picture that someone else has posted. And Instagram is free. Facebook presumably has some ideas for monetizing it, but the usual economic model, I make a widget, you like it and buy it from me for money, does not apply. Americans are fond of new ideas. A disruptive idea means it also upsets current ways of thinking, current values, and current markets. Many business schools offer a course on disruptive technologies. Is this a good thing? As children, we're taught not to be disruptive. As faculty, it's expected of us, and as PhD students, and we are rewarded for it. Of course, the meaning of disruptive changes as we grow up. Even so, it has not always been considered a virtue, and it is not a virtue in many cultures. So, where did this idea come from, that the role of a university is to produce disruptive ideas? The robes that you and I are wearing originated in the universities of medieval Europe, particularly Bologna and Padua. The highest degree obtainable at these universities was a doctorate, and so you became a doctorate of theology, medicine, laws, or arts, which meant everything not covered by the other three. This is where our modern doctorate comes from, with one important difference. Doctorates in the Middle Ages were granted for advanced scholarship not original research. You didn't need to do anything new. Our modern doctorate comes from the German university system of the 19th century, especially Humboldt University in Berlin. It offered the same four fields, plus one more, science, urged by the founder's brother, South American explorer, Alexander von Humboldt. The doctorate in arts was renamed Doctor of Philosophy, and the doctorate in science was named Doctor of Natural Philosophy. More important than names was the notion that to get such a degree, you had to make an addition to human knowledge, something you couldn't find written in a book. This notion fit well with the Age of Enlightenment, and it spread quickly across Europe. In the United States, it was the model for Johns Hopkins University, founded in 1876. Although based on the German model, a visitor to a US university at the beginning of the 20th century would have noticed some differences. For example, that American faculty and students sat around a table together and called each other by first names. Though apparently minor, these differences are pivotal because they encourage students to challenge the authority of their professors. When a graduate student from abroad starts at Stanford, calling me Mark instead of Professor Lavoie is one of the hardest things they've ever done. In fact, the entire American educational system, though frequently maligned, does a pretty good job of cultivating independent thinking. In many countries, the walls of elementary school classrooms are bare. In the United States, 
they are festooned with students' creations. A common practice in US primary schools is student of the week. It's not a competition. Over the course of the school year, every student gets to be student of the week. Its purpose is to showcase the individual, to find each student's talents and interests, and to celebrate them. I know because my wife, Lori, does this in her kindergarten classroom. I have to believe that this practice contributes to America's high rate of innovation. So you guys are PhD students, or doctors of public health, or doctors of education. I once stood where you are. How does one foster independent thinking in yourself, in others, or disruptive thinking? Let me tell you three stories. My first story is about mentoring. I studied architecture as an undergraduate. First week of freshman year, we were asked to draw a cube in perspective, but a cube with holes cut through it and extrusions sticking out from it. Uh, it was a nasty exercise. I learned how to program a computer in high school, and what I was doing was boring and methodical. So I took out a Fortran coding sheet and tried writing a program to generate a perspective drawing. The instructor wandered by and said, Lavoie, what are you doing? Put that away, take out your T-square and triangle, and learn how to draw. Then go downstairs and see Professor Donald Greenberg. He works with computers. Perhaps he can help you. Uh, so I did as I was told. But as I approached Professor Greenberg's office, I got cold feet. I had no proof a computer could create a perspective drawing. What if he laughs at me? In the end, I gritted my teeth, knocked on his door, introduced myself, and showed him my Fortran coding sheet. Well, he burst out laughing, but only for a moment. And then he said, you're right. A computer can create a perspective drawing. Let me show you. And he took out an article just published in Scientific American by Ivan Sutherland, the father of computer graphics, and described how perspective views could be generated using matrix algebra, and how surfaces occluded from your view could be removed using a depth counting technique. I barely understood what he was talking about, but that meeting changed my life. First, it showed me that computers might be more interesting to me than architecture, but more importantly, this famous professor had spent 30 minutes of his time not showing off his own work, I got plenty of that later from other professors, but talking to me about my idea. When he first showed me Sutherland's article, I was crestfallen because it meant my idea wasn't new. Don saw this in my face, but would have none of it. Maybe this idea wasn't new, maybe the next one would be. He invited me to join his research group, and uh, it was exploring this new field of computer graphics, and he has served as a mentor and role model for 40 years. Many of you will become professors. Others will work in industrial laboratories. Most of you will be parents. All of you will certainly become teachers. But teaching is not about lecturing. The next generation may download podcasts from the internet if you believe Stanford's recent experiments in online teaching. Teaching is really about mentoring which to me means guiding your charges to think independently, critically, and fruitfully. Remember, it's not about you, it's about them. Good mentors can draw satisfaction from the successes of their students. My second story is about work. In 1996, my Stanford colleague Pat Hanrahan and I developed a theory about collections of images, each captured from a slightly different viewpoint, for example, by an array of cameras. The bullet time fly around effect in the movie The Matrix is based on this idea, which we called a light field. But as a commercializable product, light fields were a non starter. Who could afford all those cameras? Eight years later, in 2004, one of our PhD students, Ren Ning, starting from this idea, realized that if you insert a tiny array of lenses inside an ordinary camera, you could take a photograph that could be refocused after it was captured. Ren knew his idea had commercial value, so after he graduated, he rented a loft in Mountain View, California. I guess all the garages were taken by other startups. And spent five years trying to talk the traditional camera vendors into building a light field camera. But Ren's design didn't fit the paradigm. 
it sacrificed megapixels to obtain refocusability, and the vendors weren't interested. Eventually, he gave up and decided to build it himself. He renamed his company Lytro, assembled a talented team, and designed a camera that's as revolutionary in its shape as it is in its capabilities. Here's a Lytro camera. You can take pictures with it, and you can change what's in focus after you take the picture. But think how long this took. From the day Ren showed me his idea at the whiteboard, he struggled for seven years to bring this to market. I've been waiting for a light field camera even longer, 17 years since my original paper. I shouldn't be surprised at this. These long intervals between academic research and commercial deployment have been well documented in a study co-authored by our own Fred Brooks. You just finished the doctorate. On average, it took you five years. 5.5 if you graduated from UNC's computer science department. You're thinking to yourself, what a slog. Glad that's over. But if you continue to pursue a life in research, your doctoral dissertation will probably be your shortest project. A warm-up designed by your advisor to bring satisfaction in publication in two to three years. The next part, you have to do yourself. Make sure you choose a worthwhile problem. In the words of Richard Hamming, if you don't work on important problems, you're not likely to do important work. Then, if you're creative, you'll have lots of ideas. If you're wise, you'll discard most of them. If you're persuasive, you'll convince someone to pay you to work on the remaining ideas. Then, be patient and persistent. For scientists, nature does not unlock her door easily. But the wonders within are worth the struggle. For engineers, there are indeed new things under the sun. And for scholars, the human condition is always changing, and the best, most useful words about it have not been written. My third story, my last story, is about beer. When I applied for faculty positions, I was invited to interview at Stanford. Naturally, I was terrified. You see, I have an imposter syndrome. Computer scientists are supposed to be good at math. I'm bad at math. If I wrote a theorem, I couldn't prove it. It would take Stanford 10 minutes to discover that the invitation was a mistake. On the morning of the interview, I arrived on campus early and wandered into Stanford's Memorial Church, not to pray for success, but because it was beautiful, dark, and quiet. After sitting for 15 minutes to calm my nerves, I started across the quadrangle toward the computer science department. Along the way, I crossed paths with two PhD students. One turned to the second and said in disgust, this place is so elitist. I was immediately a nervous wreck again. My talk went OK, and at lunchtime they sent me to the faculty club with a Nobel Prize winner and two Turing Award winners. The Turing Award is the computer science equivalent of the Nobel Prize. These worthies sat around the table debating alternative cosmologies of the universe. I stared into my chocolate mousse and wished I were on a beach somewhere. By late afternoon, after meeting with a different professor every 45 minutes, I was fried. So I wandered into the bookstore, another place of refuge and calm. Bad move. I immediately ran into a bookshelf of um, uh, books by Stanford authors, including a shelf by the the uh, professors who had just interviewed me. These books were full of math and theorems and proofs of theorems. Two weeks later, I got an offer from Stanford. What were they thinking? I can't get tenure there. I also had offers from more plausible schools for my modest skill set. I should take one of those. By the way, I turned down an offer from UNC because PhD students should move to another school after their degree. So to help me decide, I called my old mentor from Cornell, Don Greenberg. He told me I was acting like a coward, rather bluntly as I recall. He told me that if I didn't take that job at Stanford, I would spend the rest of my life wondering what if. So I swallowed my fears and accepted Stanford's offer. That was 20 odd years ago. I still have an imposter syndrome. I still can't do math. But it turns out that I know more than the students, at least when they first join. 
And every once in a while, I stumble across a good idea, or I stumble across 10 ideas, and my students help me to realize that nine of them are nonsense. And I like teaching, and I like telling stories. And these things turn out to be more important than I thought. Let me end by returning to the theme of disruptive technologies. Facebook, the company that bought Instagram for $1 billion, is itself no stranger to disruptive. For three years, I lived next door to Facebook, literally next door. I could throw a rock from my bedroom window and break a window in Mark Zuckerberg's office. They have a particular culture at Facebook, young, edgy, in your face. Their walls are covered with graffiti and posters spray painted in Wild West Wanted Dead or Alive font. One of them says, move fast, break things. There are offices of concrete floors, no interior walls, and lots of skateboards. So I imagine they do break things. My favorite poster says, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Well, let's see. Being afraid is useful. On the savanna, it kept us from being eaten by lions. Nevertheless, this is the message I'd like to leave you with, the same message my mentor Don Greenberg gave to me. Know your fears. Know also what you really want. Weigh the odds. And occasionally, make a run for it. What would you do if you weren't afraid? Thank you and good luck. <laughs>